really excited about the streak of Discworld books we're in. Because, like, I know I said this, like, a couple episodes um, ago, but it's, like, nonstop bangers until we get to interesting times. Yeah. Nice. And then we'll have to read interesting times, which will be a bummer. Yeah, but we get Feet of Clay after that. Yeah, but then we're back to good books again. Yeah. Hello, this is the Ink More Pork Historians Guild. Um, we read and review all of the Discworld books in the order that they were published. Yeah, but don't listen to our first episodes because they're bad. Um, no, I was great. Speak for yourself. I think they're brilliant. No, I was good. Our recording, our recording equipment was bad. My recording my equipment was skills, the same. And my editing uh, skills were Some of the best worst. podcasts sound like. Some of the best podcasts sound like two tin cans rattling together. It's fine. Do they? Is that true? Leave you. Yeah, I okay. actually don't listen to bad podcasts. Mm -hmm. um, That's because okay. you've never gotten into really niche cult films. So it's like <laughs> you don't even know who I am anymore. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I just yeah. realized that that was totally untrue just as it was coming out of my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Baby, I, uh, baby, I love you shit you can't even dream of. <laughs> um, okay, but let's talk uh, about this book. Now you're, now you're misjudging me. <laughs> okay, this okay. fucking book. Uh, 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 say, yeah. say our names. I'm Pertis. I use they, them pronouns. Oh, say your name. I'm... Fucking mulch. I use they them pronouns. Uh, first name fucking, last name mulch. <laughs> okay. Michi, you go. Uh, Wait, this week, Chio, you go. I, I already did mine. We're did you do it again. I'm Chio. I use she her pronouns. I'm going to do and so much editing to this. For I was about to say, you got to beep that part. How could you? <laughs> uh... Oh, yeah, and we're going... We don't care about spoilers here. Uh, you should probably read the books first and then listen to the podcast. That would be my strong recommendation. It is a requirement. Unless you just are so in love with... Unless you're just so in love with us, you just want to hear our charming voices. Okay, let's actually talk about the book, because it's been like 10 minutes and we've just been saying absolutely nothing. Yeah. <laughs> Oh yeah, okay. this week we're talking about Reaper Man, which, and Reaper Man fucks. Yeah, Reaper Man fucks. It's like, Confirms. Reaper Man does fuck. Reaper Man this is- This is the ultimate death storyline. Yeah, Reaper like, Man- in most death books, in most death books, there's like an A plot and a B plot, and death is usually the, like, B plot, um, with the A plot focusing on a sort of death-adjacent storyline. This one's a bit of a departure because it is a death a plot, and it is the ultimate death plot story as far as I'm concerned. Like to me, this story is why no more, no other death a lines were necessary. Yeah, I mean that's an interesting take because I actually considered the B plot to be Bill Bill Dor's story, mm -hmm. and I considered it one of the really? flaws of the book. Yeah, because there is less oh, of it. Oh, wow, like it that is the hottest... That's yeah. the hottest fucking take. Holy shit. Yeah. So, because the thing is... There's I consider the, the Bill Dore storyline to be the A-plot because it begins and ends the, the story. It definitely begins and ends it, but that's true of many of the other books as well. I think that... A major problem with this book really is that the wizard's story is the majority of this book. If we split this book, it would be two-fifths death, three-fifths wizards at best. Wizards, you know, encompasses a lot of this book. You know, it encompasses the Wendell Poons saga. It encompasses the Fresh Start Club. Everything to do with Mrs. Cake, all the city eggs and all that stuff. And Bill Dora's story is pretty short in comparison. It is quick interstitials 
um, throughout the wizard's story, it definitely felt like the primary um, activity of this book was weirdly enough Wendell Poon's and what he was doing, his struggle with his disability um, and coming to terms with it and the upswing of the city eggs. Um, and, and that was rough for me. I will agree that like, I will agree that most of the book is the wizard plotline, but I also feel like the most important bits of the story are the death storyline. Um, kind like of. The, <laughs> the wizard like, storyline to me is like periphery. I mean, the wizard storyline technically like, takes up more of the book. It takes up more of the book. It also has higher stakes. Like, throughout most of it, the wizard story, you know, like, that upswing is the threat to destroy all of Ankh Morpork. And, like, while Death is very much a beloved character, characters die. And that's okay. And he's kind of at peace in his own way with that fact. He's at peace as much as most people are at peace with dying. You know, they are counting the time and they are afraid of it. He he writes an incredibly um, human response for those things. Mm -hmm. And it isn't world shattering. It is sad to lose him, just as it's sad to lose a friend. And it is a quiet contemplation of that, of what it means to be alive and to matter to other people. But it isn't the main thrust of this like, I really feel it isn't main thrust of this book, and I wish it was. And I, I think that that is something that still points to the ways in which Terry Pratchett feels young at this point. Because it still feels like he's afraid to just let it be that quiet, almost sad examination. It, it feels like he puts some of this wizard story stuff in, especially the city eggs for me, just felt almost totally disconnected from the philosophical thrust of most of the rest of the story. The counterpoint of Wendell Poons' unlife and death's undeath uh, was, like, phenomenal, and I really felt it got sidetracked, again, by his necessity to have the climactic Cthulhu-like ending. Mm -hmm. um, I... Yeah, I I agree with that in a lot of ways. Like, um, because I I really enjoyed the Window Poon story, but it didn't feel like that. Like, uh, it felt like the the parts I really enjoyed about that were a lot about Window Poon's own own like situation. Like, it wasn't what drew me to it. Like, I I wasn't really invested in the city eggs or the big i mean i think it's very funny that the big bad was a mall but like it wasn't that's not what i really enjoyed about those those characters or that story um it didn't feel emotionally necessary um also like this book is extremely I agree with that though i do think it is a very clever idea mm -hmm. yeah yeah i i i feel that too but, like, this book is extremely nostalgic for me because this is, like, one of the books that I read as a kid that, like, stuck with me for forever. Like, I remember this book, but I only remember – but what I remember from this book was um, Death Storyline. Like, I remembered that forever. Like, that scene at the end with, with his – with the friend, friend he'd made, the um, – Death of Rats? Uh, no, the, the lady that no, died. No, uh, oh. Mrs. Flitwick. Yeah, Flitwick. yeah that, that, like, Flitwick. I have dreams about that still. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, I got really emotional about that when I was a kid. Um, but, this like... This is a book that made me think of you a lot, Mulch, because... Mm -hmm. Uh, I was thinking about that thing Curtis said when looking at your artwork... Uh, Mulch is an artist, and a lot of their artwork um, centers around skulls and symbols of death. Mm -hmm. And specifically what Pertis said about how 
your artwork tends to focus on making sort of um, friendly maternal images of death. Mm -hmm. And how that kind of fits together with your love of the death books in Terry Pratchett. And also, like, um, remember the book thief? Yeah. You were super into the book thief as a kid? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, so this struck me as being, like, a very you book. Yeah. It, I mean, this is definitely a book that, like, changed me as a person as a kid. Um, yeah, it's it's notable that even right now for this Discord call, Mulch's profile picture is a skull that is very maternal <laughs> and is actually the uh -huh. art piece I made that comment about, if I remember uh -huh. correctly. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, it is. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, no, I, I fuck with the death books. I, I really like them. Um, and also, this is a book uh, where death... Uh, has a sort of semi-romantic relationship with a very elderly woman. Yes, I noticed that as well. And she talks about how old she is and how old she feels, and he's like, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah. And I was like, wow. <laughs> Mulch read this book and was the same since. That was it. That was the moment. God... Yeah, it's it's you know it's uh, Reaper Man and Harold and Maude. Those are my touchstones. Yeah, please don't do the Harold and Maude thing. But those are uh, those are on my uh, mulch image board. <laughs> my vision board for mulch. Don't worry, I related mm -hmm. to I related to Harold uh, more than Maude. I just fell in love with Maude. So okay, but neither of them's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Don't be either yeah, one, we, huh? We all knew that, though. Yeah, I, I was aware that you'd fallen in love with Maud. That was not a surprise to me. Yes, I but I won't commit suicide when I'm 80. That's what I'm saying. You better fucking not. Yeah. Because that was horrible. That was a hor- that, I didn't like that part of the movie. Oh, yeah? Shocked. <laughs> I'm blown away. Okay, okay, we gotta talk about this fucking book. It, I will I, say, um, on a different note, it's like... Oh, sorry, you continue. Mine's kind of a detour. I mean, I, I do just really want to hammer home. The City Eggs thing, totally cool. I wish it was in a different book. Um, It was, for me, the only major flaw of this book was... Mm -hmm. that. I mean, it felt like a total divergence. Every time I was listening to them try and figure out the City Egg thing and listening to a wizard fight the trolley, I was like, God, I wonder what Wendell's up to. Mm -hmm. Or like, fuck, I wonder what Bill Doerr's up to. I don't give a shit. Like, if these dudes die in a trolley cart accident, that's fine. I'm okay with that, yeah. actually. I'm at peace. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. They can't even actually die right now. So it, like, lowered the stakes in a weird way within the context of the book. Mm -hmm. Because notably, you can't yeah, fucking die right now. So it was weird. Uh, that it was like, have this cool fight with the trolleys and also you can't die. And it was like, huh, I, uh, I guess... And it's kind of weird, because the City Eggs idea is, like, a really big idea. It's just one that's completely disconnected from, like, the Death and Windle Poon parallel plot lines. Because it's basically the idea is, like, malls killing cities. Yeah, it's this idea of... Which is, like... A parasitic conceptual life. A life mm -hmm. so big that we can't conceive of it. I mean, it's cathonic. It's it's fucking it's some Cthulhu yeah. shit. But it's also about something very real and concrete, which is the idea that of moles and I guess by what by proxy uh corporatism, um sort of creating these uh and specifically moles being these sort of um simulated cities that kill the real thing by pulling people out of cities and into them. Yeah. A very much a timely and like idea. Weird and the funny thing is, that's like a big idea that I would be kind of interested in seeing explored. I would have kind of been interested in seeing explored in a separate Discworld uh, book in more in depth. Yeah. 
I is mean, we're reaching the period where more and more of the Discworld books are about cities and how they function. Yeah. And what a healthy versus unhealthy city looks like. I think, yeah, I, it is a really great concept, and it's one that could absolutely be drawn out. I would like to also point out, while we're reviewing this, like, there isn't really... He doesn't even try, really, to draw a connection between the city eggs and this thing. It's not like death keeps the city eggs out, or, like, death is part of the resolution to the city eggs thing. It's like, no, death lost his job, and also, unrelatedly, we have a, city, a snow globes well, it's attack. And entirely... It, like, uh unrelated because there's also the idea, though it's like kind of a tenuous connection yeah. the idea is that there's this build up of life force because um, spirits can't be ushered into the other world Yes, and that causes, creates the conditions for the city eggs to flourish the city eggs to appear but it's also happened before at some point I guess which is yeah, like like I said, it's like kind of a hazy, not entirely fleshed out idea. Yeah. yeah. But it is brought up. Yes, yes. And and that's fair. Like it is vaguely life energy is allowing these things to happen, but they also exist anyways. And they're just like this con like yeah. I'm not super into it. Um I will say. But uh, there are one lots thing of other that I really about. liked was looking at this book and seeing how carefully plotted out it was and how, like, things that would become important later on in stories were established in seemingly unrelated earlier scenes. Like, <laughs> there's one scene um, early on where uh, Mrs. Cake smashes a vase so that uh, one of the worst characters and worst parts of the books, One Man Bucket, can use it in a fight. But... Uh, that's not what this tangent is about. Um, and later, uh, it's da death makes the super special sharp, sharpened on the breeze scythe. And the idea is he wants it uh, to be destroyed so he can use it. Yeah. Yeah, and I thought I, that I liked how was that was. And I liked, I just liked how very carefully it was established. And how there are several instances of that throughout the book of uh, one scene establishing a concept that'll uh, pop up later in a, in a later that will gain later importance as the book goes on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's clearly becoming a more talented writer and remembering to actually use his Chekhov's gun. Because that's the other thing. I mean, his problem wasn't not setting those things up it was not using them he would put those ideas everywhere and they're just like not use them there would be no real payoff for little jokes like that yeah. and i yeah. think he is doing a yeah. lot better now and actually paying off those things that he spends your time on he's recognizing that like these stories exist in this one moment together and like you have to pay off things for yeah. a book to feel really satisfying yeah. for somebody to feel invested in it too because it's like color of magic light fantastic if you skipped a scene wouldn't matter you could skip a whole fucking yeah. scene and just like keep going would never matter um yeah. and that was yeah. flawed writing um yeah and i kind of want to talk about the wizard stuff because this is like from i think this is the most successful use of the wizards um that it was definitely so like, it's the only book so far that we haven't been on the wizard section, and I've been like, I would do anything to leave right now. I want to not be with these people. Like, I, I like, enjoyed the wizard sections, and that's saying so much. I was about to say, we, we enjoyed this book, and again, this book is mostly wizards. And that was yeah. great. I think the use of Wendell Poons as, a char as the focal character, as somebody who's not directly a wizard but is a wizard mm -hmm. is perfect and it's also why unseen academicals is a great wizard story or yeah. can like... i just say that it is shocking that wendell poon is as likable as he is i know right let every me tell you something i looked up the characters just the, the wizard characters because i realized i couldn't really remember them but i recognized their names 
we've seen Wendell Poon before. Yes, in no, I know uh, we have. Book. He's in. He's, he's in a every horny old man. Yeah, he's he's in all of them. He's in moving he was pictures. The horny. Uh, yes. <laughs> so yeah, he was here's the, the like, thing: disgusting, cackling wizard with the uh, insane wheelchair. Yes. So yes. So basically, he's a different character in this book. Like he's not. Like his one, like his one of his main defining traits was that he's a horny old man. He is not horny once in this book, and that is so choice. I mean, that he's is a little bit horny, but in it's in a much more discreet way. I just I don't like, remember him being horny. He talks about Lud. He talks about Lud Miller being attractive. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. I think I think it's just that yeah. I guess we are in his head when the narration talks about that. But yeah. Um, but it's like, it's toned the fuck down. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like more in the context of matchmaking. Uh, yes. Of matchmaking the two werewolves. Wolf wares. Yeah. But he, he is there before and they talk about it. I think like that was interesting too. Like he talks about like, my mind was slow and base and I like didn't do anything of note and like that haunted me. And I think it's really, it's, it's a, interesting to see Terry Pratchett's early delves into the concept of like, Hey, should we be allowed to die sometimes yeah. earlier than maybe <laughs> death would take us? Um, and, and it would be something that he did a lot of work for pretty shortly after this too. Relatively, yeah, we you still know. Haven't, we we still haven't watched the. We're saving that documentary for later, right? The. Yeah, um, I mean, we can watch it whenever. Um, the yeah, his his yeah. death documentary. I think, I think we decided to watch it specifically around uh, the period where he got his diagnosis. Um. Let me see. When did he publish it? I mean, that would be what I would... When did he do it? Is what books did he do it around would be my actual interest. We we can figure that out. But, you know, I think this is one of the first times where he starts to talk about it. And it's interesting because it is a dangerous subject. And it's one that's really hard to talk about, too. Because Terry Pratchett... I mean, he's very careful to counter it in this. He doesn't want it to just be... When you're old, you're infirm and you're weak and life doesn't matter. He doesn't want that to be the idea. He wants yes. to very clearly communicate that there are some instances where it doesn't matter to be alive or not. That like he himself does not want to live a life in that position. And like it's one thing to be a Miss Flitworth and it's another thing to be a Wendell Poons. Mm -hmm. Um and it's it's hard yeah. for him to talk about this, and it's he he's very very careful whenever he approaches it within his works, because I think it is easy to sell the wrong idea, the idea that old people are infirm and shouldn't be listened to and don't really matter is so prevalent within Western society that yeah anything that even points towards it will be understood as that yeah um, just because of the, yeah. the cultural shift that we live in right now yeah yeah man this was a good book this was a fucking good book yeah i've been swearing a lot tonight I'm, you can swear yeah. hey 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 <laughs> we we can fucking swear on this podcast okay um yeah <laughs> ain't no yeah. little flitworths or flightworths or whatever are gonna pop out at us um Anyways, <laughs> let's talk about let's talk about something that I thought oh, was yeah. really interesting. Also, um, yeah, something I loved about this was that it really felt like it was reapproaching a lot of the ideas he talked about in Mort, and I really mm -hmm. loved the way he revisited them, and honestly, as a much smaller story. You know, while I think that he did shy away from having the Bill Doerr story be as long and as quiet as maybe I would have written it, because mm -hmm. I love long and quiet things, um, I think it's it's really wonderful to receive that same idea that like the Reaper 
something he covered in more is like the Reaper should care. Like that's what's just. Yes. What's actually really just is that death should give a shit about us <laughs> yeah. if, if it can. Um, oh, and that idea is like explored up and down in this one. Yes, it is. Yeah. Like really appealing. And way better than it was in Mort. Because what the... Oh, so much better. Oh, yeah. Because, the you know... I forgot that that was part of Mort. <laughs> I mean, it's a fundamental part. You know, he does it here too. He has that moment of indecision of can I save this person? Like, is this right or wrong? They do it twice. They do the same thing of lending time out of a timer. And he approaches it way better. Honestly, we don't really get to learn what happens to that little girl, right? Yeah. She, is she who's getting yeah, the extra sure. time for Azriel, Or is it Miss Flitworth? Mm-hmm. I wasn't super clear on that. <laughs> I kind of yeah, felt I like was, it was, it was yeah. the little girl that got more time, but they never explicitly said it. I just assumed it was that end scene with Mr. Flitworth that he was getting. Like, he was just getting, like, a few hours um, for her to, like, run around as a ghost. That's what I thought, too, at first. But then I, like, thought about the girl more, and I was like, maybe that's who's getting the extra time. Yeah. But I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it's time for the I whole admit, universe I kind either. Of thought, um, I kind of assumed that she was just dead. And a lot of... Um, like, she just died, didn't realize that she died, and um, just went on the date. She did. She well, died before they started. Yes. She d- yes, as, but as people could still see her. Yeah. She, she was dead as soon as she saw him, but like... But people could still see her. Like, people interacted with her. With her ghost. Yeah. She she died as soon as he opened the door. Or, as yeah. soon as he knocked on, on the door, essentially. Mm-hmm. If Michi's mic has stopped working, I'm going to kill myself. Oh no! I'm I'm still. Okay. Oh, oh, good. I think it's still working. You can. You guys yeah. can hear me, right? I okay. can hear you. You just didn't say something <laughs> no, for a just... second, and I was panicking. Uh, I was I was listening. Good. I'm proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is not a comment against you. Just saying, you know. Um, but 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 the uh, you know, um, that idea is important. Like, death caring. And I'm really glad he reapproached that idea. And you can see how much he's grown as a writer in the last six fucking books that he's able yeah. to approach it this way. Because Mort feels juvenile and it distracts itself with stupid, stupid bullshit. And yeah. something that's really critical is shifting the perspective from somebody next to death to actually being death really makes us give a shit. Because death yeah. is human in more, yeah. and death cares, and death is something, but we don't get a look inside. We don't get to yeah. see him panic. We don't get to see the humanity present in that, and we don't get to see a case for that humanity. Because yeah. in Mort, he has to set things right, and he has to be the law to set by in regards to death. He doesn't yeah. actually get that moment of, of humanity in in that and he doesn't get those moments of saying what can the harvest hope for but the care of the reaper yeah um the reason why i say that this is the ultimate death storyline is because this is the story um where death becomes mortal and what where he really learns what death means just from an individual perspective yeah. And a lot of the story is him trying to grapple with and sort of understand what it means to die. Sort of yeah. to look down the barrel of death. Yeah. And and also just to like interact with humans as an equal, as somebody going through the same thing they are going through and you know forever after this he knows what that was like and he has this new perspective 
perspective, and he will for the rest of his existence. Yeah. Like. Yeah. And, and he, being able to make mistakes. He, he looks at it and he tries to like understand how can they stand this? How can they stand knowing that one day they are going to die? How can they? How can they allow clocks into their houses when they know that every tick of the clock is a minute lost? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, and they talk about them. He talks about them obsessively in this way throughout the book. And throughout many of his books, you know, this is really the start of it. He starts talking about clocks carving away, slicing, hurting time. He really talks about it like that a lot. Um, And this is the defining moment for that as well, for Terry Pratchett. Yeah. Um, We will see that motif within his books kind of for the rest of the books. It is, Mm -hmm. for me, one of his stylistic trademarks. Um, Yeah. He considers a clock yeah. as violence a lot of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And there's yeah. also um, the Combine har- Harvester, which yeah. in a very literal metaphorical way comes to symbolize the replacement death. Um, like there's a scene where he's on the, where he knows a, uh, his replacement, the auditors, are coming for him any moment. And he actually mistakes the outline of the Combine Harvester for uh, for the new death. Yeah. Yeah. And this idea that, like, it, it doesn't care in the same way. Yes. And, and you know, call back to, I mean, we're Americans... We have a thousand American folktales that are the scene where death tries to outpace the combine harvester. We have our John uh-huh. Henrys, our Paul Bunyans, um, all like men who fought machines because it mattered that a man could do it. We have these aggressive anti-modernization folktales that like he's calling back to here. I mean... Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it's a delight. I, I, I really love this. I love is that this is also an amazing Maurice prequel. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh, they yeah. mentioned they mentioned Amazing Maurice and Educated Rodents like five fucking times. That yeah. book won't come yeah, out for is... another like f- fucking twenty years or something. Yeah, and which like we... this is the book that introduces the death of rats, mm-hmm. who's yeah. a very important figure inside of Amazing Maurice. Yeah, I'm. I know it's gonna be years, but I'm so excited for Amazing Maurice. I. I really enjoyed that book as a kid, and I don't know if I will as an adult, but, like, it's going to be fun to, like, go back to it and, like... I know that I will, because it was... Because it is my favorite book, period, and it's one that I revisit on, like, an annual va- basis. Mm-hmm. Uh, notably, Amazing Maurice would come out one decade after this book. Wow. Oh, Wow. <laughs> yep. Um, now that I think of it, I think my brother bought it for me and read it out loud to me the year it came out. Mm-hmm. Because I yep. was like seven and I was born in 96. <laughs> huh. Trying to look back at that. Um, it came out 2001. Yeah, he actually, um, he actually tests out. Like, this isn't the only reference or small aside that will eventually be made into a book, like, a decade later. Mm -hmm. Like, he has multiple little asides where he explores a future story idea. Um, Um, There's a brief reference to a lost tribes of wizards on uh, the lost continent of XXXX. Yeah. Uh, Well, uh... Death was sharpening his scythe. 
And um, that's going to be made into one of the worst Discworld books. <laughs> oh, fun. <laughs> that's The Last Continent, right? Yep, The Last Continent. Yeah, he oh, also uh, mentioned uh, the golems and their never-ending work in, with Feet of Clay. Uh-huh. And then did he talk about the trolls backward time for in this one yeah. or the last one? Yeah. So he, he talks talked about it in this one. He talks about the trolls backwards time, which is actually an idea that comes back and becomes a focal point in some of the other stories. Um, and to some But extent, does he give entire, it to somebody um, else? Does he give backwards time to somebody who's not a troll? No. Okay. I couldn't no, remember I if so. it was trolls or not. No, because he said it was he said it was just trolls this book. Um, he said that that was the only species who thought that time yeah. was backwards. I just thought that. Um, and. Yeah. Keep going. To some extent, the entire new start club um, stuff. To some extent, that's laying the groundwork for um, men at arms. I mean, it's laying the groundwork for so much, honestly. Yeah. Right. So yeah, many of like, the books. All specifically, like. like all the Uberwald stuff. I I think I said that name wrong, but Uberwald. Like Uberwald. Yes. Yeah. Hit those V's, man. Uberwald. <laughs> Uber Uberwald. But like Uber Mrs. Cake herself shows up in like Men at Arms. Yeah. Oh uh, yeah. Mrs. Cake shows up in a few ones. Also, um specifically the vampire couple shows up again in um Oh, uh, what's uh, the Thud. What's the Yeah, Thud. Oh um, shit! Do they actually? Yeah, they complain. They're yeah. complaining about how there aren't any vampires in the watch, or specifically. Oh she my is, and then god! They talk about, they're the black ribboners that that push for yeah. the inclusion. Yes, they're the yeah, black or ribboners. At least she is, and he's like, they're like, yeah, he's at home, like in a dad shirt or whatever, like, <laughs> like. That's so funny. Yeah. Um, I didn't. No, even I make loved that seeing them. Yeah, so I loved seeing them. So this is a great example. I I actually didn't know before Reaperman, before I listened to it, if I'd ever read this book before, and I don't uh -huh. think I have. I think I just heard snippets of the audiobook when I was younger, while I was uh -huh. over at Philip's house. Actually, um, yeah. I think I heard specifically the part where he's um, taking down the wheat one stock at a time. Yeah, I yeah. think I heard that part because that thing I remember really really strongly um but otherwise i don't think i read this book and it's great to see these connections because thud is actually my favorite one of my favorite discworld books yeah um, i would say it's my favorite what sam fine book by a lot personally Thud is mm -hmm. incredible yeah um, um my favorite might be feet of clay Feet of Clay is also. I can love Feet of Clay. Oh well, I guess I haven't seen the full version of Feet of Clay. You say so it being the one person who hasn't. <laughs> yeah, I love uh, you guys. Yeah, you guys have reinforced it in my head. The golem. I love anything. <laughs> anything to do with the golems, I obsess over. I mean, they're I. Yeah. Yeah. I love um, them. I would like to. Bring up some of the stuff I don't like about Reaper Man. Are we going to talk the about two Red Shoe? ones, I think. <laughs> yes, and One Man Bucket. The, yeah, so the race One Man spits. Bucket is so bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, God. Like, I cannot stress how bad One Man Bucket is. Basically, he's like a Native... Am he's a parody of background turn-of-the-century mediums. A big cliche used to be that they would have this spirit guide uh, who is this, like, Native American type spirit. Uh-huh. This is a parody of that, only it's worse, because the entire joke revolves around the idea that One Man Bucket is an alcoholic. It's not a parody. I don't think we should give it that credit. They say he's a Native spirit guide who is an alcoholic, he lives in teepees, in the wilds of Hwanda land. It's like, it's not, I think, I think to be a parody. No, um, <laughs> I mean, the joke is that he, he's actually, uh, was born and raised inside of Ankh-Morpork. Uh, yes. But it's worse. 
is their entire idea for him is that he is that he is specifically a spirit because he's so alcoholic and he wants to still be he needs to still be able to consume alcohol yeah i i that's just like his entire purpose like that is so bad I, I i just would like to take away some of the credit i don't think parody is correct because he just is doing the thing like it's yeah. not a paradigm because God. because when you are satirizing an actual racist overtone like thing the the line is thinner than in most other instances because the super stupid uh, native guy, spirit guide who's an alcoholic is just like a real thing. Like I could go find racist movies right now that genuinely have a character exactly the same as one man bucket. Yeah. And so I don't, yeah. I'm not going to give him parody. It's not a parody. He's just doing the thing. And that thing I mean, is funny. I would argue that those movies times. themselves are parodying it, but it's not like, it's not parodying the fact that the trope is racist. Uh, it's just making it more racist. Yes, but he just makes it more racist. I mean, yeah. you could read it yeah, either way, and right? That's like, like not good. <laughs> like if I went back to those old racist ones and I was like, "Haha, they're just like poking fun at how racist they are about native people." Like, well, I would have no. as much justification uh, in that as I would in this. Like, it, that's that's what really fucked me up I about guess, it. <laughs> let me let me say what uh, my argument would be. Um, you know the the late the late eighteenth the late nineteenth century early twentieth century um, spiritualism movement. Mm -hmm. The cliche is that they would have this native guide, and it would usually be very heavy on the uh, noble savage type thing, and there'd be like all of these sort of exotic gestures. Yeah. I would argue that those early movies are making fun of the noble savage thing and the exoticism, but not making fun of the racism. And sort of by overlaying the sort of romanticized idea of what a Native American is with uh, their, quote, realistic, unquote. So it is like, I would argue that those old movies are parroting the guide but not like in an anti-racist way in way in a way that is in fact actively more racist uh-huh yeah. yeah and i'd argue that terry pratchett is doing the same here so i don't say say i don't think parroting to say that he's parroting it is giving him credit fair that was probably incoherent <laughs> no, I, no I, I get what, i get what I you're saying say, yeah I just I, I think we, we, we should express innately I cannot express how racist this fucking character is. Yeah. I mean he, he express that it's bad. It's it's the most racist shit. It's incredible. I like it. he 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 is just a native drunk who fell in, in front of a cart because he was drunk and was so dedicated to being a drunk, he didn't actually die. Uh, his full name is one man pouring a bucket of water over two dogs, and his brother's name is two dogs fucking. So yeah. that's great. That's super <gasps> cool. Um, it is. He, he explicitly says, like, oh, they looked out the teepee, and, and I was named... People in my tribe are named... Whatever the mother sees first. And the, as soon as she looked out the fucking TP, that's the name. And it was like, yeah. I like, um, oh. I oh. don't think, yeah. I don't think, I mean, I don't think she looked out. God, sorry, let me get my thoughts in order. I mean, yeah. I think what it was was that there was a describing the tradition, which is looking out of the teepee. But I don't think she was in a teepee. No, I think she, she was in a she, just she like was. a house. She was. He, she no, was explicitly. Moved, he moved when he was very young to Angkor Wat, oh. but he was born in a teepee. That's the that's the thing. Yeah, he directly uh, says, "My mother gotcha. looked out a teepee," mm -hmm. and saw one yeah. man pouring a bucket of water oh, over two dogs, okay. and my brother, who was born one second earlier. Was called Two Dogs Fucking. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and um, he calls whiskey fire water. Another thing I would like to note, just like uh -huh. another layer of racism here. 
Wonderland is something that Terry Pratchett has used multiple times in reference. It is almost, he is almost always talking about Africa when he uses Wonderland. But in this case, suddenly it's like a place where just like, but one man puck, bucket is clearly like a stereotype of a Native American. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and notably, it actually does get more racist because you know that there is actually a Native American area that Terry Pratchett put in later, right? Uh, no. I don't think I recall. So it's not actually in any of the books. But I, as a kid, owned the Discworld Atlas. And in uh-huh. the Discworld Atlas, there is a section of the map called The Great Outdoors. And it describes uh-huh. basically a weird idea of Native American life. And... uh. He just hadn't come up with that idea in 1991 yet, even though it was so complex. The Great Outdoors is actually called that. Uh, it, I think it, it doesn't appear in any of the books other than the Discworld <sighs> Atlas. Um, thank God. Love but it. But it is, it is it. something he did. Oh. Yeah. No, he actually recognized later. Well, that's not great. Yeah. No, it's, it's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Good and cool. Good and very actually, cool. Great. Great. Love it. Um, um, he put it up north in the Wittershins so like, land. I'm going to be blunt. Like one man bucket is not only like the worst part of this book. It's one of the worst parts of like any Discworld book we've read so far. I don't know if I'm going to go that far. Like, hey, let's not forget that we were in the Clatchian jungle and Eric and I had to listen to that for a while too. Yeah, there's some like yeah. especially the early books. There's like some sections like all of the like this pamphlet oh, blue you somewhere haven't even gotten and... to uh interesting times yet that oh. one's an entire yeah, I was book a, devoted to being i was about racist. to say i don't think we should give him i don't think i think we're being overly kind if we say the early books because the truth is there are the difference is just that the jokes are smaller <laughs> and, but uh-huh. there are plenty of them right like yeah uh, you mentioned yeah. Tawanda Land. Um, canonically, Lady Sybil Ramkin's family did, like, do murder campaigns. They mm. did a scramble for Africa with Tawanda Land, except it's played off as a joke because oh, he just ran out of enemies to fight in this area. And so he started killing people over there, too. Which, like, Wait. is funny. Oh. It's like, a, it's one of those things where it's like, It is funny to parody those things, and it's funny to point out that English families and royal families have this background, but we'll get to it. The way he tells the joke is kind of weird, and and it kind of implies things that aren't great, and, you know, Wanda Land will come up again. Um, It came up a little bit already, and it wasn't too bad, but, um, you know... (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> yep. So should we talk about like the red shoe stuff now? Yeah, let's talk about red shoe because I think it's more interesting. I I I like red shoe. Yeah. But I think I mean, it points it to less something unambiguously that's flawed. I would say the red shoe shoe stuff I have a problem with, but it's like. It's less unambiguously terrible. It's not unambiguously terrible the way that um, just the one man bucket stuff is. Uh, yeah. yeah. See, uh, for like for Red Shoe, like the thing is, I like Red Shoe, and I think Red Shoe is right about a lot of stuff. But I don't like that Red Shoe is supposed to be. I like a Red like, Shoe is basically a. Uh, Terry Pratchett's parody of a leftist radical. Yes. And this... Uh, is, and I, I, I don't think that's the real problem. I think the real problem is much more nuanced and interesting than that. This is, this is something I think he does a couple of times where Terry Pratchett's interactions with political involvement do clearly have a lot to do with the kind of neighborhood advocate 
which exists in many parts of Britain, the kind of stuck up, um, kind of pointlessly wheeling neighborhood advocate. And so when he thinks of politics, he thinks of people like that, but then in his books, we'll give them much more serious and important things than those people are wheeling on about. So the humor yeah. derives from this like idea of a little man who cares about this little corner of a thing, but then he gives huge issues to them and they become yeah. horrible because of that. It is, it is indicative of his inherently like privileged interactions with politics. The most important politics that Terry Pratchett really had to interact with by that time is small shit. Like, should there fucking be bike lanes or like, how does the trash get taken out? Right. Yeah. Not real shit. Like, See, am I, I a human fucking context. being? <laughs> yeah. Because and that's, that's like one of the big frustrate things that sort of set my teeth on edge about red shoe is the fact that he's talking about issues that are going to become like serious plot lines in later books and that are important but it's treated as being like a joke and like kind of ridiculous and embarrassing yeah and see that frustrated me in um uh what's the book night watch too is that red shoe is actually talking about like big important things and even and more so in night watch is he's being treated as a joke um really like, see i kind of didn't get that. Like, to me, Nightwatch is the most dignified portrayal of Red Shoe. Uh-huh. Like, in any well, of these books. He's well, a Monstrous got... Regiment, too. Yeah, I got... I haven't read Monstrous Regiment yet, but I got that same f feeling. And I, it did actually... Um, I, it did actually bug me more in Nightwatch because it felt like he was being made more of a joke. Like... This, like, he's definitely also a joke in this, but, like, it bugged me more in White Night Watch. I can't really explain Well, I think why. I think the difference, and it's been a while since I've dealt with Night Watch, but I've dealt with Reg and a lot of the other ones. I think a, a big difference becomes when we see Reg from the point of view of people who are like him and the point of view who are, of people who are not. Because Wendell admits that Reg is right to some extent and right about some things and so do yes. all of the people who are in the fresh start club whereas like because they have to because even terry pratchett in writing it this way recognized like this is a fundamental question of identity so people who are this will agree with him because of course even if he's going about it this silly posturing way this stupid silly roundabout way I like mean, a, but of course they'll agree with him silly? like Red Shoe saves uh, Wendell Poon, like, by sticking these little cards and these bits of information in coffins. He's doing exactly. something really important. Well, except that but it's he, exactly. he, ridiculous. he does do some silly things. Like, I mean, he he seems to be completely I mean, he detached. He, he Well, okay. He's completely detached from the reality of the situation, which is, like, the, number one, he believes that, like, all people could be undead and that there isn't any reason they shouldn't be. They're just being lazy. That is like fundamentally yeah, detached from the reality of this situation. Yeah. And, and it is that something that's brought up like a one lot. Of the things that, and that's something that really grates on me about how like Red Shoe is written because it's like this weird mixture of him like doing things pointing out things that are, like, actually really important and doing things that could actually, like, save somebody and, like, him doing and saying things that are completely ridiculous and detached from reality. And it feels like both things are treated as being as the same. Uh-huh. Yeah. And, and, um, and, and that's, that's really a problem. I think Terry Pratchett does this a couple of times in his books where he has people who care about an issue and, and are pushing for it politically, but it's clear that the only way he's interacted with things is this really specific, really gentle and not caring way of interacting with politics. Because he, he really hasn't yeah. had to fight for his right to exist. And he doesn't yeah. understand what the difference and politically is between those points. And I think he will do it again in these books. And there's one. And this is the first really big time. And there's like... Yeah. 
one specific thing here that really got me, like really pissed me off, which is they uh, talk about singing songs like The Streets of Ink, Mork, or Pork, and We Shall Overcome. And then it has this little asterisk which it, on We Shall Overcome, which is oh, a my song God. in which various languages is common on every known world in the multiverse. multiverse. It is always sung by the same pe people. V-I-Z, the people who, when they grow up, will be the people who the next generation sing We Shall Ever Overcome at. And it's like, holy shit. Yeah, that was the craziest like, fucking shit I ever read. I, 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 I yes, I, like, I was like, oh my god. This is that we are Americans, and like, We Shall Overcome here is so specifically associated with the civil rights movement. And it's like, very yeah. specifically about black liberation. Yeah. Whereas, like, in Britain, it's more associated with the labor movement, but, like, still, yeah, hearing that treated as being being something, like, some sort of silly generational thing, generational rebellion thing, is just, like, fucking floored me. No, yeah. yeah. No, that shit hit hard. I want to know, like, <laughs> this is an American song. Like, we, 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 should, we, we will overcome is an American song song and it was like um as early as 1910 associated with the racial movement you yeah. know like nearly at its conception so it is not this is not a purely american it's not like this, um, <laughs> that is not like this is we shall overcome it's not like a hippie song it is like uh, uh it's like it is very specifically a song that is so strongly associated with black liberation and black civil liberties. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. <sighs> uh, I mean, the the song is, especially in America, synonymous with Martin Luther King. Because the yeah. Selena, the, the Montgomery March, his most, one of his most famous marches, they were singing that song. Yeah. Much of the way. And, like, absolutely, it's been used for worker strike. It was used for anti-apartheid stuff, which would have been relevant because, hey, apartheid ended the same year this book came out. God. Oh, fuck me. The same year. Huh? Pretty sure. Yeah. Um, oh, God. <laughs> God. So, uh, cool. <clears throat> cool, 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 cool. Um... That, I think, was, like, the worst Reg moment in the book. That footnote was one of the most blindsiding footnotes I maybe have ever encountered. Um, yeah. It was really it was really rough. Uh, a, apartheid would literally have ended right then. Um, and the American Civil Liberties Movement will never finish because life is hell. Yeah. Yeah. God. Um, not to be a fucking leftist, but <laughs> things are <laughs> not to be a leftist, but it's things a, are bad. <laughs> things are a little bit bad. Um, God, I so so uh, to return to a kind of earlier point, but also rich related. You're you're completely right. It's because of the perspective that the story is being told, and that Night Watch bugs me more. Um, yeah, yeah. It's because it's uh. this is being told from someone who does recognize that red shoe is right about a lot of things and connects to what red shoe is talking about night watch he's just i mean it's from sam vine's perspective and it's it's just it, it just night watch is a really interesting thing is like a really interesting book mm -hmm. i'm looking forward to talking about night watch uh two years from now yeah, and I yeah. mean, Red Shoe appears a lot. Like, Red Shoe yeah. appears, like, all the fucking I mean, time. And Sam Fimes, I wouldn't say Sam Fimes hates him, um, but he doesn't that, think a lot of it. I would say him. that to Red Shoe, um, to Sam Vimes, Red Shoe is a joke. Yeah, he's, like, he's like kind of annoying. Um, he's just in the way a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, that's also, like, Red, Red Shoe makes a small appearance in monstrous regiment and it is also kinder because the people who are seeing him relate to him yeah yeah 
Man, every time I think about Monstrous Regiment, I like it a little bit more. The longer this fucking book club goes on, the farther I will rank Monstrous Regiment. Uh huh. I'm just well, saying. I'm excited to read it. Yeah, we'll get there in a year or two. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, What's yeah, and we're probably going to do, like, Hogfather out of order. Oh, the next book is uh, Witches Abroad, and Pertis and I are going to have a fight. It'll oh. be very I mean, I'll revisit it. it. I mean, I'm excited to revisit it. It was one of the first books I retouched on. I was not super into it. Kind of racist, but... Um, if I remember correctly. Witches uh, Abroad is one of my favorites. I mean, again, it's not a bad book. I obviously, it wasn't turned off but i have some problems it's with my it. favorite granting weather wax but see that's just so fucking crazy to me <laughs> hey hey you want to fight i liked granny weather wax and equal rights more than i liked her in witches abroad uh <laughs> i because i thought it was I a better even, story like, for her see that that is such an unserious opinion to me that i don't that i'm not even mad like I can't take that opinion seriously at all. Uh, I'm right, and I'm going to defend that point later, maybe. We'll see. No. I'm excited to hear Malta's perspective on it. Yeah, because yeah, I'm the one who hasn't read it before. So I'll be the tiebreaker. I'm shocked you haven't read it. Um, wait, before we... Uh, I don't want to wrap up quite yet, because because I think like if, if we're going to talk about Red Shoe... What something we should talk about is like Wendell Poons and Red Shoes and talk about like Wendell Poons has this disability story. Yeah. Because I thought that was something that was like really unexpected from Terry Pratchett at this juncture. And it's something uh -huh. that he honestly doesn't touch on a ton. But Red Shoe very much or not Red Shoe, Wendell Poons very much a lot of his stories is recognizing that he has a disability and trying to come to terms with it and trying to come to terms with what that life means mm -hmm. and the interaction between red shoe and Wendell Poons, as well as all the rest of the fresh start club is like critical to that. Like the fresh start club, they're all disabled in some yeah. way or another, right? They're agoraphobic or they're socially anxious or, Except for Doreen. Mm, I think Doreen. I don't. Hey, uh, if you met somebody who was acting like a vampire by marriage <laughs> and was obsessed with the concept of <laughs> seeming dead, would you say that that is normal, abled behavior? I wouldn't say it was normal, but I would. Um, I would think that it's probably like a hobby. Yeah, I would not like think that that is. definitely seems like a hobby. <laughs> that seems like a mental illness. I'm going to tell you right now that if you think you're dead, and or, or you are obsessed with seeming like you are dead because of a marriage, we should talk to a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> like, no offense, I follow a lot of weird people, um, and I, I, I love them. I found it, I found it interesting I that she wasn't affected in by... Like I was, I was impressed. I was uh, interested in the fact that the narrative took her, like, that she wasn't affected by the mall sa song. Like I was curious about that, because yeah, I noticed that too. Oh, it wasn't right. really it confronted, but like, yeah, she just like wasn't. She just didn't care for it. Mm -hmm. Don't know why. Um, but yeah, you know, I think, I think that that was. I, it's something I really didn't expect to see in this book. It was something I I really don't expect to see in any of his books. The honest truth is, like, as much as Terry Pratchett is an insightful and clever writer, he is also extremely bound, especially in these early books, by his personal experience, as we're talking about with Red Shoe, or as uh -huh. we're talking about with fucking One Man Bucket. He is bound to what he knows. That, I would say that he has, like... I think Terry Pratchett's perspective in a lot of the way he writes is that is very like liberal. It's very much um he wants progressive, but he 
progress, but he's very much like bound by the idea that the status quo is sensible and that really challenging the status quo is silly, absurd, is inherently silly and absurd. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I agree to some extent. I think that part of it is that his... I mean, I think he's, especially in the later books, he has a very, like, kind of odd, conflicted perspective. I think... Where it, it's oh. like there are two threads that are tugging apart. But, like... I think some of it... I think it... a lot of his tone, especially towards, like, revolutionary rhetoric, tends to be very, um... I don't know. Like, his knee-jerk reaction to hearing about... Uh... Okay, I lost my train of thought. Sorry. That's okay. I think some of it is his style of writing. I think that because those are ideas that are constantly under attack, it's hard not to read anything like that as an attack on them. Just like I was mentioning before, with the idea that like sometimes dying is okay and good, you know, and he didn't want to portray someone as old and infirm as just like that person should die. Um, and like having an honest talk about it. I think that's something he struggles with a lot. Like, by all accounts and interviews, like, Terry Pratchett would become, relatively, to, like, an older English man, pretty radical. And, like, a lot of his writer friends are radicals, straight up and down. Um, See, maybe that's just because I haven't read any of his interviews. Um, but, like, especially in his later books... It's like, there's a clear delineation between things he writes about very seriously and very earnestly, and things he makes fun of. Yeah. I think that he was never fully equipped to be, like, true radical. I mean, he... I mean, we're seeing a lot of these faults now, right? He unlearned a lot of stuff by those last books, but... Man, he had a lifetime's worth. <laughs> he had yeah, a lot. Yeah. Um, I mean, even if you, like... One of his last books, his last Discworld books, is um, Raising Stream, Steam. Which is basically, like... This might be something we argue about, but... To me, Raising Steam reads as a love letter to capitalism and embrace the idea that technolog that free markets and technological progress progress and technological evolution can make the world a better place. I mean, c c but yeah. we'll probably talk about that in like we'll, more detail. We'll get to raising we get steam because uh, I think it's years from now, a decade from now. Yeah. Cause uh, yeah, I, I think that he makes his point much more nuanced than that, but that's like a whole, discussion because I, I think he does recognize the inherent harm as well in raising steam and in stuff like the combine harvester um i mean it would be hard to write as an englishman who grew up seeing the troubles and not talk about the damage workers receive it would be a feat yeah yeah anyway i think we got distracted oh. i just want to say like Wendell Poon's story of accepting his disability and Red Shoe's counter of, like, was really sweet and really touching. It is rare to see a genuine take on disability that recognizes, like, yeah, this is something that's hard and it needs help. And there are benefits. And it is worthwhile to keep living. And there are unique things to be found in it, right? Like, I'm extremely autistic, have been my whole life. As much as I have learned to love that about myself, it was not easy. And, like, mm -hmm. it is so rare to see a story that, like, gives a shit. 
that it's hard and beautiful and that it's hard and worth living and that it's it's genuinely hopeful about what it means to live and die that way you know um and and you know in to some extent even approaches that it's worthwhile to fight and be the red shoe even if he doesn't do a great job with it <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, but Wendell Poons and Wendell Poons' monologue, genuinely extremely touching and um, something I really, 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 really didn't res- like expect to hear. Yeah. 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 Um, I really liked this book. I really liked this book, too. Yeah. The um, Fresh Start Club was so sweet, and I loved them all. Yeah. I even love Doreen. Um, yeah. Um, man. Unlike... Unlike... A, discussing this book is hard. It's a little bit difficult for me because it feels like I have a bunch of, like, completely unrelated observations. Mm-hmm. And, like... One of them is that I really like Ridkali. I think he's like, I think he's a, an important addition to the Wizards uh, cast. Yeah. And like, the Wizards stories got immediately better after he was introduced. Yeah. It's why why they because kept. The thing they, about a lot of the Wizards me. is that they sort of blur together. Mm-hmm. And Ridkali kind of stands as like a stark contrast. Yeah. I um, I love the addition of Red Gully and he will be he is genuinely one of my favorite Wizards characters. I just like love that he's like fuck yourself we're doing this and like really pushes him to do things at all <laughs> in ways that I are like, like philosophically so sound. Tegan? I like that he's a parody of this sort of like old uh English sort of sporting gentleman yes and like i love the little details about him like the fact that he keeps a cross pro in his hat in case he sees something he wants to shoot while he's out jogging mm-hmm. yeah and the alcohol in his hat too in the point the whiskey he... in the tip of his hat yeah i just love how completely ridiculous wizards hat wizard hats are but most of the time the descriptions of them aren't that interesting because all of the wizards kind of blurred together and are the same character. Mm-hmm. So I like that Ridkali's hat has all of the like insane decadence of a wizard's hat, but it's very customized to his specific character. Uh huh. Yeah. Um. It's it's I one of my other favorite notes is that his brother is the, the yeah. head priest, the lead, the high priest of Blind Eo. And makes mm-hmm. several appearances um, from this point onwards. Yeah, he appears. Uh, yeah, most notably, I think in going postal. I is think, he? Like, is he? Is that the one? I think so. Oh, I don't I remember don't him. Remember in, because in going postal, he chooses the god Offler. He uses the god Offler. No, he uses the um I thought. The god the goddess of uh lost things, or I think like things that are jammed in the back of drawers. Well yeah, but I, I thought he had an argument with the high priest at the god of uh at the Church of Offler. Like you're right. The the I gold so. is attributed to what's her name? I do not I remember. Don't remember. I don't know. We'll call her Misophonia right now. Um, is attributed to misophonia, <laughs> but like I thought he had discussed with. I mean, it doesn't really matter. We'll figure it out. I think he did, but yeah. Uh, something that strikes me as being um, interesting is looking at this book, and apparently, like a lot of the core aspects of the wizard's personalities were established in this book. 
-hmm. Like, this is the one where the bursar stops being uh, the straight man Mm. and starts to go off of his rocker. Yeah, I mean, he literally Uh makes him lose his mind in this, which is choice. (laughs) And then, like, Ponda Stibbins uh, takes over the role that was formerly occupied by the bursar. Mm -hmm. Not in this book, but... Okay, I was like, was Ponda in this? I didn't notice him. Yeah, no. No, Ponda wasn't in this book a lot at all. Uh... Because that, I remember that being something that really confused me about moving pictures. Uh, because when I first read these books, I read them out of order. Uh. And so I kept on mentally mixing up the Bursar in the early books and Ponda Stippins in the later books. Yeah. Because in the early books, Bursar later, Bur- the Bursar plays the role that Ponda Stippins would eventually take over as sort of the uh, straight man who does all the work. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad the wizard parts were not insufferable, this book. I know, they weren't even horny. I'm really proud of them, genuinely, unfortunately. No horn- like, yeah, I just, I'm so, I'm this, so proud of him. This is... What... I think this might be the least horny wizard. I mean, not only the least horny wizard book, but like the least horny Discworld book we've had so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is pretty good. Equal Rights wasn't super horny. It was horny in places that were noticeable and uncomfortable. This is fair. (laughs) I think that having to write a child the whole time did help it be less horny, though. Oh, for sure. Yeah, but they managed to be, like, weirdly horny about Granny Weatherwax. Which, I mean, fair. I mean, yeah, like... Who, yeah. Who's not weirdly horny about <laughs> Granny Weatherwax? For once, I'm on your side with this one. <laughs> Terry Pratchett likes old women. He's one of my favorite characters. Ter- Terry Pratchett loves old women. And we that's, really feel it. That's so valid of him. Oh, it affected Mulch like... significantly. <laughs> it, it made mulch who they are today. So critical. Was de- de- developmentally significant in my life. <laughs> Speaking of old women, uh, I like how like death in its human personification was sort of lightly coded as being an old man. Oh, he is such an old man. Which, I mean... Yeah, I mean, it seems obvious, but it's kind of appealing. Yeah. To have that sort of subtle indication, like, he uh, he courts an elderly lady, um, and when he hangs out with humans, he ends up hanging up with the hanging out with the uh, the elderly men. Uh huh. With the elders. Yeah. This was a great fucking book. I yeah. love. I love death section in this. Like, I know it's, it's hard. Just so quiet and significant. It's hard to even talk about it because I don't feel I can add anything by really saying a lot about it. Uh huh. What can I say that? Yeah. Isn't already written in that section? I could wax philosophical about death and caring and birds and prisons, but it wouldn't matter because he already did it and he's a better writer than I am a speaker. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know, I I could I could blather on and it would be of no fucking use because I would rather just say, Hey, go read every Bill Door section. I don't care. You could cut out the rest of this fucking book. I don't give a shit. Reading Bill Door's <laughs> story is exceptional and and sweet and kind and the ending (laughs) i mean hey listen if this book had ended with just the miss flitworth part and just death's thing and and didn't have any of that mall thing i would have been weeping openly uh in the middle of the night uh (laughs) forever yeah um it is legitimately I, I love that um, so romantic and heartbreaking and lovely I and love kind. that final date with Miss Flitworth yeah that was it was so beautiful 
Yes. Yeah, I, I didn't cry this time because I knew what was happening. But when I was a kid, I, I bawled like I was sobbing, like. I mean, it's just lovely. I mean, it really is. It's, it's really wonderful. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and I'm so glad to see him really start to do this. He did it a little bit with Guards Guards. Um but having these stories that are really just people's lives playing out and being and loving them for it. I mean absolutely adoring them for it. This is one of the times where we get to see it the first and it's incredible. You know, he you can tell he's running up on the idea in some of the other books. Um, and he, he gets close sometimes, but this is phenomenal. And it will remain f forever as one of his best examples of that. Because yeah. there's no character that Terry Pratchett cares more about than death. And there's no character that he can do as kindly with. Um the build or sequence and the addition of build or into the death canon would forever change not only this series but i think terry pratchett himself and uh, mm -hmm. the importance of this section and mulch and, well, and mulch the importance <laughs> but, of this section on on so many people is cannot be understated yeah. i mean you know all of us have a conception of death which is significantly warped by the fact that we read terry pratchett books Thank yeah. God. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. He shared his philosophy around death incredibly well. Yeah. That being said, where are we ranking it? It's number one. It's number one for me, too. It's number three for me. Number three underneath Guards, Guards, and Weird Sisters? Yeah. Uh... Okay, here's the thing. I put them in the... I like all three of these books a lot. Um, for me, Reaper Man and Weird Sisters was kind of neck and neck, and I put Weird, Sis Weird Sisters above it simply because I know I'm going to think of Weird Sisters more often. Because, like... Weird Sisters just had a bigger impact on me, and it appeals more. And it and it appeals more to me specifically in a way that I think Reaper Man doesn't. And Guards Guards, I just Guards Guards is one of those weird books that I've realized I can read infinitely and never get sick of. I I like don't like, I, can, I can listen to Guards Guards. And then I can flip it over and listen to it again. And I can just do that indefinitely. Ooh. Ooh. I, I respect what you're saying about Guards Guards about an about... infinitely reading book. But I like can't agree with you with about putting Reaper Man below Weird Sisters. Because for me, Weird Sisters just had... It, there are parts that are really good, but it just had really major flaws for me. The romance between the fool and See, the thing is, like, Mugrat, whatever the fuck her name is. What is her name? Mag Mag See, Magret? The thing is, I can understand why that Magret. bugged you, but it just didn't actually bug me at all. Like, I just didn't care about the romantic plot line. It didn't actually bug me. Fair. I, I personally... Weird I could Sisters has a better stru I think Weird Sisters has a better structure than Guards Guards. I mean, not better than Guards Guards, sorry. Uh I think Weird Sisters has a better narrative structure than uh Reaper Man does. I mean, I will give you that only because of the fucking city egg thing. If if the city egg thing wasn't in this book, I would fight you to the death to put it at number one. Um Again, the City Eggs thing it just isn't bad. It just doesn't fit in this book. Yeah. Yeah, it feels like something that should have been developed further inside of a yeah. different book. It could it could have been its whole other own book, and it would have been perfect. 
Yeah. Well, could we could we compromise at putting it at two? Could at putting it at two above Weird Sisters? I think. Yeah, I'm fine with that. I think so I'm a little surprised you two aren't trying. Yeah, I'm I a little think it surprised the two one. of you aren't fighting me to be number one, since both of you are putting it at number one, and I'm not. I mean, I just think both of us don't care about the list as well. <laughs> As no, I do. think it should be at number one. Oh, do you want to? I, I mean, hey, I mean, Mulch, do you want to? Do we want to fight together to put it at number one? I think it should be at number one. I think it should be at number I, one. I, I, I think it's significantly better than Guards Guards. Um, this was like not even a question for me. I thought you were totally going to put it at number one too. Guards Guards for sure, infinitely readable, definitely has flaws. Of the Sam Vime stories, especially, definitely not the best. Whereas this is like one of the best death stories ever written and a book that affected both Mulch and I forever in me without even having <laughs> actually read the fucking book. Um, so yeah, it, it's going at number one. Sorry. I would Sorry. put it at number one for, okay. for the scene of what can, uh, for just what can the harvest hope for, but the care of the reaper and the speech to Azriel. If that alone was in this, I would have put that at number one. Above guards, guards. Uh -huh. If I'm being honest. Uh huh. Yeah, it's at number one. Okay, so it's... I put it at number one. Okay, good, good, good. For the big list. For the yeah. big list, it's at number one. Some point we should do a mini episode where we just go over our list because I, I bet at this point our lists are just wildly and comically divergent. I think I think yeah. that Mulchanize list is probably pretty similar because we've voted similarly many times. I think your and my list is going yeah. to be extremely I'm different. Weird. I'm a little confused by the fact that Mulch and you have similar tastes than Mulch and me do. I'm not surprised by that. Yeah, because I do yeah, agree with you. confusing to me. Like, I agree with you about a bunch of stuff, so it's kind of weird, weird to me, too. Um... But it's just like, it's like I agree with you about a bunch of individual stuff, and then in the end, but then like, overall, uh, my my tastes are more like Pertis's. I think that what Mulch and I look for in a story just happens to align. Our our mm -hmm. deep love for humanity and like abounding compassion is something that's really rooted in a lot of these Discworld stories. And therefore, like that's what we're looking for in these. That's what we remember from them, and our passion about them. These careful character analyses that are filled with love. Um, you know, those are yeah, for us the are very much you, the same uh, nature. I think what happened is that I read a different set of Discworld books growing up than the two of you did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I mean, for re for relevance, like Hogfather. I've, like, Mulch could have handed me Hogfather. I don't remember at this point. But, like, Mulch and I did yeah, exchange I didn't these grow books. Up reading Hogs yeah, I, yeah, um, I that's the first one I ever showed Hogfather. you was Hogfather. Yeah. yeah. That's the, the first one I ever showed you was Hogfather. So, like, um, part of the reason we read the same books is literally Mulch handed them to me. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, like, yeah, that definitely, I mean, Terry Pratchett is a very prolific writer and these books touch on very different matters i didn't read a single one of the fucking wizard b books because why the fuck would i um and like that <laughs> fundamentally changed what my concept of Discworld is and i only read books I after like book 20 books, i think the witches books had a pretty big impact on me <laughs> and um amazing maurice like dominated my life yeah and i didn't read yeah. those like, I didn't read those books. Amazing Wreath probably, like, more than any other single book impacted the way I think and see the world. Wild. Yeah. I'm I'm excited to reread that one. I am. Yeah. I love Amazing Wreath. So. But yeah, I think it'll be fun just to do, like, a mini episode one of these days where we uh, look and see how different our lists have become. Yeah, I think the last episode, both of us did actually name all our books and the order. Um, I, I It'll be pretty fun to see. When we get to that halfway point, uh, book 20, Hogfather, that'll be a good measurement spot because yeah, the Hogfather yeah. 
But aren't we gonna do? Uh, aren't we gonna do Hogfather around Christmas, regardless of where we actually? No, 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 are? no, 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 no. no I We're gonna we do should. the Hogfather decided... movie. Yeah, we oh. we decided against doing the book Christmas. Okay, I remembered something something Hogfather Christmas. I just didn't remember that it was the movie. We did talk at some point about reading the Hogfather at Christmas, but at this point, uh, we might be better off hitting it next Christmas at this fucking pace, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, and we're at, um, we're 11 books in right now. I yeah. put the, uh, I decided to number the lists, so now the Historian's Guild list is numbered. Good. Cool. Uh, yeah, we, we started this project nine months ago. So, for perspective. <laughs> well, that's, that's more than one a month. That's not bad. We're supposed to do one of these every two weeks. <laughs> yeah. That means we're we failing 50% like of the time. <laughs> we did not uh, manage that. That's true. And we started for, doing them once a week. Yeah, that gave us a little buffer room. That was for bad. How much we failed. Yeah. So we're doing a really bad job. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, but I'm well. so excited because the next book is Witches Abroad, which is going to be polarizing and controversial. Which I mean, I didn't, I didn't up. hate the fucking book. I, I really feel like you're misrepresenting. I didn't hate the fucking book. It's just like it wasn't that great. Is fine, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I'll and retouch then we're going it. To talk about uh, small gods, which is one of the best ones. I'm so excited to do small gods. Yeah, I'm actually really excited for small gods because I kind of skimmed it when I was a kid. I don't think I really got it, um, but divine oh, the divine you're books. You're going to love small gods. Yeah, I think I'm going to like it a lot because the divine I books. You. The divine books are my favorite books, and like. Small Gods is something he was like, ruminating would... on for a long time and impacted all of those f fucking books that I love so much, like Thief of Time. Like, I would bet actual human money that both of you are going to love Small Gods. I mean, yeah, I I've, never, you, I've never read like, it before. It might, like, it might be our number one slot. Uh, like, lis listener, for a fun joke, part of the reason that Mulch has never read Small Gods is because I own Mulch's copy of Small Gods. Oh really? I think still it's at my family's house. <laughs> it really has funny. your name. It has your name in it. That's really funny. The reason oh, neither wow. of us have read Small Gods, really, is because I have it. I have your copy of Small Gods. The Jesus. funny thing is that Mulch, I think, has another copy of Small Gods, like inside of a three book thing. Oh yeah, I have a tr trilogy thing. That I think I do have small guns. Oh, I can't trilogy. stand trilogy books, so they're always so fucking heavy. They are very heavy. Um. Yeah. Anyways, I um, think uh, I think that's why you've never read it. Congrats! Now you know. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Okay. Oh, is there God. anything else we want to hit on? Oh yeah, There's we're gonna have to watch. Things. We're gonna have to watch Grebo. Fuck! I forgot about that. <sighs> Is this why you really like Witches Abroad? It's because it follows a cat for a while? Oh, yeah. Uh, the cat. You want a serious answer or a joke answer? Yeah. Because the real answer is no, I just really love fairy tales. And Witches Abroad is one of the most, like... Witches Abroad is, like... 50% riffing on fairy tales and sort oh, of... Oh, like 95%. Them. 95%. Uh -huh. Yeah. And I love that. And I love... I love how the story thinks. Yeah. We'll, yeah. we'll get into it. Like, it's... realistically, I could... Like, realistically, I could take or leave the travel log aspects of it. But yeah. I love the fairy tales fairy tale stuff and i love how granny works within the fairy tales yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's not again it's not a terrible book it's very short so hype for that Let's okay and oh. then after small gods is lords and ladies which is one of the witches books i kind of don't remember i don't i never uh, read it i'm and then we've got men at arms which i love i'm so out men of depth with these book early books i like I didn't read any of these motherfuckers. 
I like yeah. almost feel bad because I'm like, really, I fucking seriously, dude. After I only read basically after Hogfather. I mean, I was really on top of them, but I I didn't read any of these early books. I didn't give a shit about them. And I, hey, listen, yeah. I'm gonna be it's real. Like, I was right. Like I don't care. <laughs> like Reaper Man is the first one that I genuinely feel sad I didn't super read earlier. Um, yeah. All ten books before that, I could. I'm not super mad. I skipped, except for I. I I did kind of hear some guards, guards. Like, because to me, like guards, guards, from like God, guards, guards to about um, amazing Maurice. To me, this is the best period of Terry Pratchett books. Yeah, like to me, this is the the best section of Discworld books. Yeah, and for me... And so, like, I'm, like, so excited right now. He he gets way better after he knows he's going to die. Oh, wow. I strongly disagree with that. Uh, like, he got diagnosed in 2007. Like, Let me double check what book released in 2007. Or, I guess, 2008, for fairness. Oh, yeah, baby. We're making money. We're going postal. Yes! This is my fucking steez. Um, no, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I genuinely, like, Hogfather so onwards. Me. I think, like... That's my shit. Because to me, I think, like, after Unseen Academicals, the quality in the writing plummets. Yeah. I mean, you don't like, like them, but I, you know, I really like Snuff, for instance. Um, I mean, I like Snuff. I just don't like the way it's written. I have a signed which copy Which may sound like Snuff. a weird thing to say. But, like, there's a certain point, I think it's I Shall Wear Midnight, where the style, his style of prose writing and how he writes dialogue, like, changes radically. And I hate that style of dialogue and writing. Yeah. Like, it actually makes reading the books hard for me, because I can't stand how they're written. So even while I like... I like Snuff a lot. I think it has a lot of really powerful and interesting ideas. I find it hard to read just because I hate the dialogue and I hate the prose writing. Yeah. In this discussion, I think it's notable to recognize I uh, never read The Shepherd's Crown. I could never bring myself to do so. Um, it is too sad. <laughs> the Shepherd's Crown The Shepherd's Crown is also the one Discworld book I haven't read. I, I, I could never... I own a copy of The Shepherd's Crown and everything. Um, I just, uh, you know, I could never bring my... It was published after he died, and I couldn't bring myself to ever read it. Um, yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, I've, his later writing yeah. is definitely my pref preference. After um, Hogfather, I read essentially all of these books, um, and they're legendary. Things like Going Postal and Thud, particularly, like from I'm looking at it 2003 um onward like that shit's legendary <laughs> I think that he's yeah. such a good writer by that time and the work he's doing is like so incredible thud makes me cry every fucking time god I'm fucking thinking about it and I might cry I a little bit thud. like thud is heartbreaking and beautiful and yeah um thud I think the book I want to read to my nephews from that point onward, you know, we're talking the final quarter of these books. Something that I really love about them is that he allows himself to feel very strongly. Something that's missing in a lot of these early books is his own voice as expressing himself and feeling really intense emotions. Um, that last quarter, he's doing a lot of that. Hat full of sky, monstrous regiment, thud, going postal... And especially a little bit, like, Making Money is not my favorite book, but something that's really interesting about it is, like, his angry examination um, yeah. of life, of boredom, of sadness, and, like, almost being furious against it. Like, I I love the ability to express that emotion and, and, and to love people for it still, and love himself for it because it is his own emotion. I um that's the that, those books are legendary to me. Yeah. I think I mentally divide the books up differently than you do. Yeah. I mean, I you know, they're all 
he gets better at different things at different times. Um, I, I mark Hogfather as the halfway it's... point, both because it is the literal halfway point and because it was the first book I ever read of his. Um, yeah. I guess and... the thing is, like, my way is kind of, like, very impulsive. I guess, like, I think of the last um, four for maybe five books as being totally different than the other books. And there's no, like, external reason to do that, except that I think the writing is just so different. Yeah. I mean, you know, he had like, a stroke, and he was contending with his illness. We... I think the last four or five are different. Snuff is a very different book yeah. than Thud. And it's because he's going to yeah. die. Yeah. Like, um, it's it's to the point where if you told me that there was somebody writing these books along with Terry Pratchett towards the end, I would believe it in an instant. Like, to me, it feels like an almost totally different voice. That's really interesting. I don't agree with that at all. Um, that like, it feels like a different voice. But I, I can see, like, I agree that he changes. Um like when we get to I shall read I shall wear midnight I'm going to have to like read sections out loud and bits of dialogue just verbatim to explain what I mean because there's a cadence and flow that isn't there in previous books and one thing I notice is that like characters voices kind of start to blur together and suddenly there's this thing where characters take a long time to say not very much or like the dialogue suddenly gets very repetitive and very long-winded yeah and i hate it because it actually it's it feels unnatural um well and still yeah did. well we'll we'll see i i don't agree with you at all but um i'm excited to retouch those books with you. Um, I think that the writing definitely does change and what he's saying definitely does change. I think one of my great hopes was and remains that like it very much still is him. Um, he just has different I mean, things to consider. Him. I think it's still him. Like these ideas are very much like very, they're very much evolutions on the ideas that show up in previous books, and they're still, like... I don't think they're, like, ghost-written or anything. Like, it's still, no, no. to me, very clearly Terry Pratchett. It's just that the style of writing changes so much that... It feel... Like, the prose feel like they're written by somebody else. I mean... You know, he, he did have a degenerative you know, disease. Yeah. Affliction. And I guess disease is not quite the right word. Yeah. So I mean that makes sense. Um I don't think that style I don't think that stylistic change is something I noticed, but I, I would definitely believe that it's there. Um it just didn't impede the way I read uh, the later books yeah. at all. And I also, I, I you know, I perceive... the reason I keep on harping on about it is because it's something that is, like, glaringly obvious to me, but I don't see anybody else talk about. I perceive... So it might just be something that just bugs me specifically. I perceive a stylistic change, but I, I think of it differently, right? Like, to me, yeah, there is a stylistic change. You're right. They are more long-winded, and they're having more of these conversations. For me, though, that stylistic change started before that moment and i mean i do is think, like, an there old a man's evolution earlier i think there was a thematic shift earlier but i think like the prose writing change really no changes really noticeably and really radically and there are elements of that prose style that pop up earlier like, Unseen Academicals has a few lines of dialogue that I strongly associate with later Terry Pratchett, with the 
final Terry Pratchett books, but most of the book is not written in that style. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to finish what I was saying. Um, oh, sorry. Like, I, I agree with you that there's a stylistic change and that like those things adjust. But uh, yeah, I really don't see it as... I, I don't see it the same way as you. Like, to me, of course, this writing is getting like that. Like, to me, there's a certain aspect of, like, how old men write and, like, these, like, kind of sometimes approaching... He's approaching a lot more ideas and things that I think deserve that kind of slow, repetitive, head-banging frustration of it, you know? And he's talking about a lot of those things, like, in making money. I think there's a lot of that. There's a lot of... It's not my favorite book. It's not my favorite most one book, and part of it is because of that. But also, what can be said? What is the solution there is no triumph over the simple fact that you have to be alive every fucking day it's just that it's just you thinking that over and over and over and over and over and over and it's this kind of um it's unsatisfying in some ways but it's also much more human to me and it's sadder um and and it's something i, I enjoy i don't think we're entirely I don't think we're entirely talking about the same thing because when I say that they're more long winded, I don't mean that they're like, if it was just them having in depth discussions about serious topics that were long, that wouldn't really bug me. The problem is that like a character will take three sentences to say that they're going in another room. I mean, yeah, it's where like trivial, inconsequential things characters like will take a long time to say something very simple and not particularly important that they could say in one sentence or yeah and, and i think words. and i think you'll you'll probably bring us or like show us individual examples of this when we get to those books um but also just like i do think that has impeded your reading of them much more than us and i i don't like, I, I do find oh, that really I know interesting. It is. Like, I do find that interesting. I kind of wonder, like, what... I, I guess, like, I don't know as much about, like, pro... Like, specifically, like, stylistic prose. Um, I think you're disadvantaging yourself there. Only writer <laughs> in this group. <laughs> the fuck? Yeah, but I, I'm, I'm just winging it. <laughs> I, um, shut up. <laughs> um, but I, I'm not, you know, I'm not a literary analysis, and you're pretty much a literary analysis. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, I, it is interesting to think about. I think, I think we should like return to this within later books because i think we've been talking about it for a long time um but yeah, it's definitely it's, something no, we should come like, back to i don't think there's a meaningful way to have a discussion about this until we like get to the books in question and yet we <laughs> keep talking about it because this is like yeah. the fourth time we've talked about it in 11 books <laughs> but yeah. uh, i'm you sorry know. it just it just dominates my mind because like i think pertis and i categorize or the shifts in style of the Discworld books just so differently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're a much... I, I rarely get to say this in my life. You're a much more organizational person than I am. Um, and, like... I have never heard me call me. <laughs> no, hey, but I'm going to admit, it's something that frustrates the hell out of you and is maybe not good for you. But you care a lot about organizing things. I mean, the whole reason we're doing That's this true, is like, because you I wanted to make an ordered list of best to worst books, um, a task which is both foolhardy and insane. Um, <laughs> and useless. It's just something I really want to do anyway. Yes, and you're doing like, it with like... I cannot emphasize this enough. This is useless. No, hey, hey, <laughs> hey, I'm really aware that it's useless. 
Um, <laughs> and it's something that you're doing with several things of note. I mean, oh, yeah. you watched every it's goddamn Disney point where... mo- movie. It was. But it part was of that is like dangerous. Yes. Well, part of it I found is that like I don't know what to do with my brain if I don't organize things mentally. Like I feel like if I watch a great movie, I feel like that movie like I don't have the necessary tools to analyze or think about it. And so being able to like put it on a list of something is like feels like the only orderly way to watch it and think the only way to give myself structure when thinking about it. Yeah. Um, I respect you. I don't like, I don't understand at all. (laughs) Um, and sometimes it causes you great distress, but you are a far more organizational person than I am. Um, and like to you splitting up the, the eras of Terry Pratchett is much more important than me. Um, and I think of it as much more fluid than you do. Like there are some things which I think he evolved out of way earlier. And I think of those as separate eras and I think of different parts. Um, like there's a moment where he thinks about respecting women at all. And there are a ton of these little evolutions that he does. Um, and you know, when we talk about these books, it's a lot of what I talk about. You might notice is like, callbacks and evolutions and the ways he's fixing things he's done is like critical to this work for me um, yeah which makes my whole I'm really glad organization we decided to watch this and i mean that we decided to read these in chronological order i know every fucking day i'm grateful because I mean, it's so order so valuable um it's, it's really so, enlightening yeah, it's, it's really, really enjoyable and, yeah, and you I'm, know, I'm really, I'm really excited for absolutely none of us except for you. When we get, I'm really excited about uh, in a few episodes when we get to Men at Arms, because that's a book that like I like more and more every time I reread it. Like I love Men at Arms. Uh, we're going to get to going postal and I'm going to lose my fucking mind. That book severely impacted me. Uh, I, would, yeah. I, would, I would say of all of the books on this list, Going Postal is a book that like changed who I am the most. It's certainly the one that I think about when I think about you in Discworld. Yeah, I mean... I... Uh, the character of Moise von Lippovig is like written all over my person, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um... <laughs> uh, it affected me deeply so I'm really excited I'll lose my mind when it gets a going postal I, I have so much to say about going postal that nobody has ever asked me about so <laughs> okay I'm fucking tired and I'm, I'm going to go eat dinner now okay that sounds, okay. That sounds... Uh, okay any final notes on no. Reaperman no this book no, that no. we were ta- we've, supposed to be talking we've covered about. this so thoroughly that we spent like a half hour talking about other Discworld books I mean the honest truth is <laughs> Reaperman is not ripe for conversation as I mentioned before just go read the fucking book he does a great job